symbols and throw them on a stack. Okay, as we look at them, we'll just put them on a stack so we have them stored up. And now finally we get to the C. And I have my, my machine in some state say, hey, if I see a C, I'm going to go into a short little loop of two states long that looks for a 0 on the stack and then a 1 on the stack. And I'm going to pop them off. And then I'll move on and read the next symbol. If I see a C, there's got to be a 0 and a 1 on the stack. That's the only way you could possibly generate a string where there's a C here in the middle. So you push all these symbols on your stack. And then you read through the C's and the A's and the B's. And you program your machine so that when it sees a C, it goes into a two-state loop that looks for a 0 on the stack and pops it, looks for a 1 on the stack and pops it, then comes back, and then it reads the next symbol on the tape. If the symbol's another C, it goes through the same loop, hoping to pop a 0 and a 1. If the next symbol's an A, it's going to pop a single symbol 1. If the next symbol's a B, it's going to go into a loop of five states long, which will pop 1, 0, 1, 1, 1. It's a finite machine. It's a deterministic machine, and it uses one stack. So every one of these grammars, no matter how long the strings are, no matter how many of them we have, A, B, C, even all the way up to Z, you could go home and write a deterministic machine for them. If you're not sure you can do it, I'll add it onto the problem set next time, and then I'll have to force you, and then I'll help you do it. But it wouldn't be so bad. I could give you this, and I'd say, make me a deterministic machine that does this. It isn't too bad to do. You could also turn it to Chomsky normal form and convert it, but that would be non-deterministic. So you don't want to do that. You want to just think about determinism. Put this in the stack and then pop them off deterministically. There's never a choice what to do. Either it's going to work or you die. Or Sharon, you look like you're trying to figure it out and it's all confusing. I guess I, I understood what you just said. I guess I'm just um, furrowing my brow over the, how we got from L1 intersects L2 must be in the form of a grammar like the one that Oh, well, because, you know, don't even think about it. Let, let's, just, let's just, I'll just go back to PCP to begin with. I know that PCP is undecidable, so I want to solve it. And in order to solve it, I'm going to come up with these two grammars again. And then I'm going to intersect them and take their complement and give that to somebody who knows how to check whether a language is everything. So I can assume it because I constructed it myself. I, I came up with it. So I know that these two languages can be deterministic without any loss of generality. I don't even need this intermediate step. You can even forget about it. I'll just take these two languages and intersect them myself. Should, should we write this machine, or can you do it? Is it? Boring to write it, or should we write it? It's not that long to write. It's about a few steps. Let, let, let's write it. It won't take too long to write. And then maybe it'll take the mystery out of it. Let's, uh, where's a good place to write it? I'll get rid of the no instance here. Let's write it here. It starts here. If it sees a 0 or a 1, it just pushes it on the stack. So 0, anything, push it. 1, anything, push it. OK, it pushes the zeros and ones in the stack. Sooner or later, it gets to see an A, a B, or a C. OK? So I'll say uh, A, B, C. Doesn't matter what's on the stack, right? Is that OK? Can I have this all in one arrow? I want to do different things depending on whether it's A, B, or C. If it's C, I'm hoping to pop off a 1, 0 from the stack. If there's no 1, 0 on the stack, I don't want to accept it. So I've got to make three arrows here. A, B, C. Why can't you do that with one? Oh, because you can't throw it away. Never mind. I can't throw it away, right. I can make an E move. Right. All right. So if I see an A, what should be on the top of the stack? The only thing A can generate is a single one. So there should be a one on top of the stack. And what do I do with it? I pop. And then I go into a 
big processing state to process the rest of the A's and the B's and the C's. If it's a B, what do I do? Right, I go through a five state chain where I pop off 10111. 11101, right, I need to pop it off in reverse. So this is a long chain, and when I'm done popping them off, I go into the processing state. Right? So that means I saw B, and the symbols that a B could generate were there, so I matched up and things are fine. And if I see a C, I have something that is two symbols long. So I need just zero is the first one I pop off, zero pop, and uh, doesn't matter, nothing, one pop. Don't look at anything and pop the one. And now I get to this state and I just have these same kind of things, two long loops, one for A, three long loops, sorry, one for B, and one for C. The one for C is two long, the one for A is one long, the one for B is five long. And I keep processing and processing and processing A, B's and C's until sooner or later the stack is empty. There's no more zeros and ones there. We ate all these up and there's no more A, B's and C's to generate them. E, Z, Z, and we accept. So it more or less looks like that. I didn't do every detail, but I did a lot of the details. It isn't too complicated of a machine, and it's definitely deterministic. There's no choices to be made at any point along the way. All right, maybe that helps, maybe it doesn't. Um, if this is confusing, just take my word for it that these are deterministic languages. And if you get it, good, and if not, take my word for it for now. I'll leave this for now. Let's get back to here. So, I want to solve the PCP problem. I know somebody who's got a way to do this. I make my two grammars. I intersect them. I take their complement. I give it to the person who can check if that complement is everything. If they tell me it's everything, then I know that the intersection is empty. And if the intersection is empty, then I know there's no solution to my PCP problem. Chaining right through all these logical steps. We don't have closure. Let's, let's, let's talk just about that. That's the last thing to talk about. I have to convince you that this really ends up being a context-free language so I can give it to the person who has this alleged algorithm. Let's see what happens here. L1 intersect L2 is something, and taking the complement is something that I keep telling you is going to be a context-free language. How do I know that? Let's rewrite it. Here's the coolest trick. This is De Morgan's law, right? So this equals this. So here's what I'm going to do. I take my L1 and L2, which I know are deterministic, and I complement them. Therefore, they are still deterministic context-free languages. Then I union them. Are they deterministic context-free languages now? No, but they're context-free, because the union of two context-free languages is context-free. And every deterministic context-free is context-free. So there's two closure things here. The complements stay deterministic context-free because deterministic context-free languages are closed under complement. The union of those two stays context-free because context-free languages are closed under union. So I take this and I give it to the person who can check if it's everything, and I'm guaranteeing to them that it's a context-free language. And then they can tell me if it's everything. And if it is everything, then I know that this is nothing. And if this is nothing, then I know there's no solution there. If it wasn't everything, then I know that this is something. And if this is something, then I know there's a solution to that. So I can get all my answers trickling back. Only if somebody knows a way to do this. But I can't get any answer to this. That's impossible. So this long, clever method I have of connecting these two problems serves to show nothing more or less than this problem is just as hard that I can't really do this. Does it show that this problem is hard for deterministic context-free languages? No, this problem is easy for deterministic context-free languages. And the reason it doesn't is because when I union these together, if I got a deterministic context-free language, that would really show that it's hard 